Silas and Timothy, to the Church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continue to mention you in our prayers. Remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you become a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who's rescued us from the coming wrath. And now over to Neil, who's going to preach this passage to us. Tonight's our beginning of our new term in terms of our evening series, and we are doing two things. So most weeks when you come, it will be one or two Thessalonians. We're going to preach straight through those books in a series called Life on the Front Line. So what does it mean to live for Jesus on our front lines day by day by day? And I'll say more about that later, but it's hopefully going to be practical for work, for family, um, for living for Jesus in those places where we're mainly amongst people who don't know him. That's the plan. And then interspersed with that throughout the remainder of this academic year, we're going to take chapters from a book that I read by a guy called Glenn Scrivener, who's an evangelist. And he wrote a book called The Air We Breathe, which I think possibly was the best Christian book I read last year about how Jesus has transformed our culture even if people don't realize it. And it's good to have our eyes opened, but also good to be able to get into conversations with people who wouldn't say they're Christians, but actually lots of the things that they believe, they only believe because of Jesus. He changed the way we see the world. So we want to do some thinking about that to encourage ourselves to think that our faith has plenty that's really good about it but also to get into better conversations with non-Christians who don't know anything about Jesus, but actually believe many of the things he did about progress and equality and about science and compassion. These are all things that came from the Jesus revolution. And so we're going to be thinking occasionally about those. Right, let's uh, get into this then. So keep those passages open in front of you, the one that Shona read. Uh, it's going to be a bit of a kind of two half tonight so it's a sort of introduction to the series as a whole then there's going to be a little break and then i'm going to look at the chapter that shona just read and as i've said we're going to be looking at life on the front line what does it mean to live for jesus in the day-to-day -day of life so yeah one thessalonians keep that open in front of you um, and any other passages that we use tonight will be power pointed on there so um, you should be able to see the verses as we use them so yeah, life on the front line. I want to think tonight about first love. And the reason is that the church, these letters written to the church of Thessalonia are some of the earliest in the New Testament. The Christians there were incredibly young. Um, they didn't know much about the Lord Jesus at all. And we'll find out why in a minute. And Paul's great concern as he writes these letters is that they have forsaken their first love. That the love that they seem to have for Jesus would be proven to be not genuine that it wouldn't stand up to sort of persecution or trials or suffering, that they would just give up and his work would have been in vain. And I don't know about you, but it's hard kind of assessing where your own heart's at, isn't it, I think. So do you love Jesus as much as the hour you first believed? That's a hard thing to judge sometimes, isn't it? That initial rush of, of love and joy and peace that sort of comes when we know we're forgiven and the God who was distant suddenly becomes very real. And the Holy Spirit takes up dwelling in our hearts. And there's that connection between us and God that wasn't there before. That carries with it all sorts, I think, of emotions. But love's more than that. But in some ways, it isn't any less either, is it? 
those things that we love, the people we love, the things we're passionate about, naturally fill our lives, our diaries, our hearts, our words. And Jesus was absolutely insistent that first love matters. I'm not gonna, it's not going to be on the screen behind me, I don't think. So actually, we will turn this one up. If you turn with me to Revelation, then chapter two on page 1,234, one, two, three, four, makes that quite easy to find. So Jesus was insisting the first love matters. Writing much later to the church in Ephesus, so many years later, Jesus put these words in there. He said um, to them, if you pick up a verse two, if you're there, chapter two, verse two, I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You've persevered and endured hardships for my name and you've not grown weary. Now, up until that point, you would say, wow, what a church. What an incredible thing this church has done. Um, They've worked hard for the Lord. They've kept going even though things have been tough. They're strong on doctrine. All of that is good. But in the midst of all of that, the Lord then says this to them. He says, yet I hold this against you. You've forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Here are these young Christians in Thessalonica. They're under pressure. They've left behind their old way of life. They've embraced the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul has lost connection with them. It would be a bit like if you did a beach mission, which I know some of you did this summer, and you have a great conversation with someone, and they seem to put their faith in Christ, and then you kind of lose touch with them. You've maybe even exchanged numbers, but they never seem to reply, and you begin to wonder, is something up? Or someone visits the church that you're a part of, and you have a great conversation with them, and then they just disappear, and they're not there for week after week after week. You begin to think, what was that all about? Is that person okay? And Paul's separated for reasons we'll see from these guys. And I wonder if in his mind were the words of the Lord Jesus, the ones about forsaking your first love hadn't been written yet, but the parable of the soil was known. Do you remember the second soil there? Jesus says, others like seed sown on rocky places hear the word and receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. And I wonder if Paul was thinking about the Thessalonians that way. Had they fallen away? Was their faith firm and robust? Or had they given up on the Lord Jesus? Were they those without root? Were they those who actually didn't really know much at all about him? And when trouble had come, they'd given up. Paul, Silas, and Timothy actually visited um, the Thessalonians on their second missionary journey. There should be a, a map showing the route they took. Uh, those of you that know Acts, it starts down in Jerusalem. It starts badly. Uh, Paul and Barnabas fall out, and that then creates a new partnership with Silas. And then they pick up Timothy en route, and they arrived in Philippi, which you can see at the top. I think I've got a highlighted um, slide with that on. There it is. So Philippi is up there. And some of you will know what happened there. Do you remember that Paul and Silas were arrested, beaten, and then thrown into prison. That is referenced in Thessalonians. That's why I'm making these things. I'm not pointing out anything that's not coming up. Okay, it's not coming up tonight, but you're gonna hear a reference to that. And some of you will know um, that after that, there was a miraculous deliverance of Paul and Silas. Do you remember? They were singing God's praise in the prison and there was an earthquake and all the prison doors flew open, but Paul and Silas decided to stay. And from that, the jailer, when he saw how they behaved, said, what must I do to be saved? Their witness on the front line right there to that man just doing his job was so strong that he became a Christian. I think for many of us, that's a longing, isn't it? That our lives would make an impact for Jesus in that way. It wasn't the miracle you see that saved the man. You know that, don't you? It was the, the, the doing nothing of Paul and Silas, they're not running away. That was the witness to him. Isn't that incredible? 
It's in the ordinary that their faith was seen because of extraordinary faith to do that. But nevertheless, they were severely beaten. And so when they went to the next places, they'd have been scarred and bruised, probably limping as they arrived in these places. Like someone, if you saw someone had been beaten up in the street, I don't know if you've ever seen that, or you've had a conversation with someone who's clearly been in a fight. That's kind of how these guys would have looked at that moment, really battered, really bruised, really broken. So when they go from place to place, not only was Paul short, that's what his name means, but he was also bashed up. He would have been cut a very unimpressive sort of a figure as he went into Thessalonica. But that's where he went next. And Acts tells the story, and I want to read it to you tonight because it's only 10 verses, and I'm not even going to read all of them because it'll show you what happened when he got there. Initially, his mission there was very successful. Acts chapter 17 says, as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogues, the Jewish place of worship. It's going to be on the screen as well. And on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. So there was a very strong reaction. Some of the people that responded were Jewish, as usual, but incredibly, a lot of the folks were not. This is a big Gentile church. And so they went from worshipping idols and other gods to worshipping Jesus Christ. It was a very, very different way of living and behaving, which was which separated them from everyone else around them. They would have stood out like a sore thumb. They 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 didn't look and behave in like anybody else was behaving now. Their their whole way of life was transformed. It was an incredible response to the gospel. And I want you to note there that it says on three Sabbath days. So that means Paul was with them a maximum of just under four weeks. So he was only there probably for about a month. Can you begin to see now why he would be so worried about what happened next? It'd be like you're doing Christianity Explored and you're planning a sort of eight week course and four weeks in, the whole thing gets canceled. Actually, COVID did that to us. We were doing a group up at the King's Head pub and before the thing finished, though some of you remember, the pandemic hit and we could never finish the course. Well, it's like that for Paul. He's not planning on just being there briefly, but here's what happened next. But other Jews were jealous. They rounded up some bad characters. I love love the way Luke expresses that. Who were these guys? Rent a mob. Anyway, from the marketplace, formed a mob and started a riot. There's always guys up for a fight and they found them. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials shouting, these men who've caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They're all defying Caesar's decrees, saying there's another king, one called Jesus. I love that. (laughs) <laughs> because they've grasped something very important about the gospel, haven't they? Wouldn't it be good if it's, I hate those guys, they're always going on about Jesus. They believe he's some sort of king. They keep pretending he's God. He said they picked up something, but it wasn't good for Paul and Silas and their ongoing mission there. They actually, under the cover of darkness that night, left, and they went to Berea, which you'll see is further around on the coast, and then from there to Athens, which you've probably heard of because some of you have been there on holiday. So that's also important in the story of this book, because while Paul's in Athens, and some of you will know he reasons with people there, and he he speaks to some kind of intellectuals who believe what he says until he talks about Jesus rising from the dead, he, he gets really worried that these guys have given up. And so he dispatches Timothy back the other way. He sends him away. And uh, Thessalonians then is written on the back of Timothy's report. So it says here, when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. You see, that's right there. It's not that I'm smart, it's just, it's there. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? So we can see it. 
We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage your faith so no one would be unsettled by these trials. So you wouldn't give up. So you wouldn't lose Jesus. And then pour us to wait. There's no mobile phone. You can't just ring him for Timothy to come back the other way, telling him how it's gone. But at some point, while Paul is in Corinth, where he went next and lived for a year and a half, Timothy comes back. And it says, but Timothy has now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. We're going to see a lot about faith, love and hope throughout the letter. But Timothy comes back with this very positive report that actually all things considered, they are doing extremely well in terms of walking with Jesus. So that's a whistle stop tour. If you want to look at it again for yourself, Acts 17 is the place to look. And then if you read on from there, the stuff about Athens and about Corinthians, you will find the other bits that are in here. But the important thing to hold on to is this. They did not forsake their first love. Even though they were persecuted, even though they had four weeks teaching, even though they were pagans. So they didn't necessarily know loads even about the Old Testament. They were God-fearing, so they may have had some understanding. But the majority probably would be in the pagan temples every week until they were saved. They stood firm. I find that really encouraging. That actually at the end of the day, the Lord holds on to those who are his, whatever their circumstances, no matter how tough it gets, even if they don't know that much. And the letter to the Thessalonians show they did get really confused about some things. They were really muddled about Jesus coming again. Whatever Paul had said, they'd not really fully understood. I think some of it was because their understanding of the afterlife was so shaped by Greek culture, which was like this shadowy afterworld. Resurrection was just like, what is that? And what does that mean for us? And has Jesus already come again? And when's he coming back? And should we just stop working and put our feet up? Because if he's come, what's the point? You know, we might as well just look at the sky and see if he's coming. Could be today. So there's a certain amount of confusion that runs through both letters. But by and large, the letters are super encouraging. They're not generally as well known as, say, Philippians or Ephesians. I don't quite know why, but maybe it's your favorite letter. Most people wouldn't choose Thessalonians as a favorite letter. But when you read them, their tone is so encouraging. I think Paul just loved them so much. He says he likes them in some places like he's their father, in other places like he's their mum. I think like a parent, he's really anxious. Uh, for the first time, Oscar went traveling on his own this summer. and There's a certain amount of anxiety when he's going on a coach to go on an aeroplane, and you're no longer near enough to kind of be able to help him. He's out of reach. Now, thankfully, when he got there, the Angels were there and sorted him out. But that bit of time and separation creates a certain amount of anxiety. If you love someone, some of you have been through this many more times than we have. And Paul felt that anxiety like a parent. And then when you get the letter back, the report, oh, he's doing really well. You know, they're really living for Jesus. And it's amazing the things people are saying about them. So Paul was thrilled. And as we work through, the first three chapters are really the story we've just been looking at. And then the second two and into two Thessalonians are really about equipping God's people for life on the front line in the light of his coming. So there's a lot here about the second coming of Jesus. I think two things. I think some of us are very confused about Jesus' second coming and what it's going to be like. And I think for a lot of us, it's just not relevant. So we don't live our lives very often thinking Jesus is going to be back soon. We're soon going to be in the presence of the king. This whole world is going to be gone and renewed, and we're going to be in a place that's amazing forever. And yet so often that thought doesn't permeate our thinking in the way that it should. So I'm hoping this series is going to do that for us as well. Now, before we look at the first chapter together, here's the thing. We all have front lines. So places where we come into contact with people who don't know Jesus. Um, it doesn't matter who you are, you have them, unless there are one or two of you in here who cut your own hair, but not most of us, most of us don't. So for example, even if you don't see many people, many of us will have somebody who cuts our hair who's not a Christian. If you shop in a local shop like we do from the church, that's a point of contact. But the truth is many of you go much deeper than that. If you're in a workplace, you've got colleagues who don't know Jesus. 
Some of you in your families have that opportunity regularly, hard as it is, to be amongst people who don't yet know Jesus. So I'm interested, I'll give you a moment, just to talk to the few people around you, you don't have to move your chairs, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to, you can think about it for yourself, but just to maybe share, where are your front lines? Where are the places where you need most help to live for Jesus, where you have most contact with people who don't know him? And why not share maybe one thing? I'm not expecting you to pray now, all right? I don't think there'll be time. But why not have one thing that maybe tomorrow morning, you could say, I pledge to pray for you tomorrow morning about that one thing. Okay, so tomorrow morning, one thing with someone by you, you could pray for, connected to their front line. I'm going to give you two and a half minutes. So go, don't faff around. And get your Bibles back open at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. If you shifted to Revelation, we're going to stay where we are for now. So my big thing tonight, the big point is simple. To maintain our first love for Jesus, we just need to be regularly giving thanks. If we keep giving thanks for things, then our love for him will remain strong. And uh, so here, Paul, Silas and Timothy, we've looked at them and their journey. They went to the church of, Thessalo of the Thessalonians, and which he says is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just worth noting that he puts those two side by side. For a Jewish man to do that was huge. To say there is an equivalent to God the Father and his name is Jesus is only possible because Paul believed absolutely that Jesus was fully human and equal with God. And then he says, Greet grace and peace to you, which is standard greetings, but they are so much more than that. And what we're going to see is when we reach chapter five, and I can't remember who's preaching that, but I'm not going to steal their thunder, that grace and peace reappear because grace and peace are the beginning and the end of the Christian life. We're saved by grace, we're sustained by grace, we're carried forward to eternity by the amazing grace of God. And we're given peace with God because our sins are forgiven. We grow in our understanding of that peace as we go through the seasons of life with Jesus, and there'll be eternal peace, shalom everywhere in new creation. Everything will be at peace with God everywhere. And so that's where we are. Um, but in terms of um, uh, this particular passage, Paul then immediately turns to thanks. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember for our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Six things, we're gonna go quickly. And so just a minute or two on each. First one here, one thing we can always do when I'm feeling down, I become very self-obsessed. Remember that little voice in my head I told Hedley Park about last week and Philip Street about this morning? It's very inward looking. It's all about me. And actually one of the quickest ways I think to recover our love for Jesus is the nasty things I say about myself, I wouldn't say about you. Because I see God's work in your lives and in your hearts and the way you're growing. And when I stop and think about that, I genuinely feel encouraged. And so Paul does that here as he starts off. I don't think he's feeling down. He's feeling elated. All of his fears are to one side. These Christians haven't given up. And he says, look, here's what I see. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith. Faith in Jesus Christ works its way out in practical ways. Do you remember James said, faith without works is dead. And Paul's saying, I can see by the way you're living that your relationship with God is real. Your labor is prompted by love, not feelings, but are willing to sacrifice themselves for the good of others, for the good of the gospel. And then their endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. They kept going day by day by day because they were looking for something better. They were looking for better rewards than the ones this world could give them. They weren't just living for comfort or ease or to fit in or to make financial gain. It would have cost them financially to become Christians. They would have become poorer because they were Christians. I can explain why on another occasion, but it just followed. And so they kept going because they were looking for something better. Here's the thing. 
as you get to know other Christians, keep asking yourself, Lord, show me what you're doing in their lives. Help me to slow down and actually see what you are doing. Most of us by nature are quick at seeing in ourselves and others at times what God hasn't yet done. You know, the areas where people still need to grow, their sharp tongue, their critical spirit, their, their, their temper problem. I'm just listing my things here. I'll come on to some of yours in a minute. And we can just zoom in on those, but it defames God when we do. You know, one of the things I like about being older now is I've actually known Luke Dar on the computer tonight since he was 15 or 16. I've known Brian's son, John, since he was a similar sort of an age. Alex, since he was slightly younger than that. Emily Bakula, all of that time. Why? Because they were in the youth group when I was a youth leader. And some of you have known them longer still. I'm looking at Paul here, who can go even further back with some of these guys. <laughs> yeah. The point is this. When I was preparing this and I slowed down just a minute to think about those four guys and what God's done in them over the decades, I can't struggle but to think, wow, what a God we serve. There's Emily serving on her front line, which I'm not going to say where it is because I guess we want to put it online. We can't do that. But most of you know where she is in the Middle East, serving on her front line, doing the most ordinary of things going to the school gate, sitting in the park, going to the old folks' home, her front line. Looking at Luke and Alex buying a house into this neighbourhood with all sorts of plans about their future, but thinking about being near here so they can do it in fellowship with brothers and sisters. Thinking about John, who bought a house many years ago so he could raise his family in this neighbourhood and their front line at the school gate at Cheddar Grove where they know many people, to see the growth. How can that not make me love Jesus more? Do you see, and I'm sure you could do the same thing if you slowed down and said, what do I see in those around me who I know best? The growth. I have to stop looking at people because I've seen you grow. And it's the most thrilling thing. We can give thanks for that. Second thing we can give thanks for here is we can give thanks that God has saved us. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he chose you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know, that was a, a one-off event in their lives, but your pattern and progress were very similar. The way we're saved is similar. At some point in eternity past, before he even made the world, God chose you. And here's the thing. We often immediately think, well, what about all the people he didn't choose? And we wrap ourselves up in knots and say, what kind of mean and spiteful God lives this way? The Bible never does that. The Bible always says you wouldn't have chosen God if he hadn't set his love on you. Right before he made the world, he had you on his heart. He actually created this world so you could be born and then born again so his son would have a bride for all eternity. That's his love for you. It's an amazing thing. It's an eternal love that stretches back into eternity past Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, dreaming of what is yet to come and being inspired in their own love for you. And so we can give thanks for those things. But at some point in history, the gospel came to us, not simply with words, but with power. The word of God is in itself powerful, but there always needs to be a moment where we hear it and where we receive it. And so although God chose us in eternity past, part of that plan was that someone pointed you to Christ. There's the odd person that comes in an unusual way, like Vlad, one of our missionaries, who found a skip, a Bible in a skip. And that was part of his journey to faith. But there were still people who explained the faith to him, who preached God's word, and it came to him with power. And the deep conviction there may be the Thessalonians, that they felt it right in the heart. Or it could simply be that Paul said, we really believe this. So when we explained it to you, we did it passionately. 
We really wanted you to believe and you received it in that way. Again, when we feel really down or we're struggling or we wonder do we love Jesus, we did at first, it's not wrong to go back in our minds and think, wow, that's how you saved me. You loved me in eternity past and then at particular moments you brought people across my path. I first heard the gospel from my mum. I was taught it in Sunday school. I was then having it preached to, and when I was a teenager, the Lord brought that message to me with full conviction, and he changed my heart by the power of his word and the power of his spirit. And we could go around this room, and you may not know exactly when it was, and that's just how it is for some of us. Don Carson says the first thing, he's a great theologian, wrote many books, commentaries, doesn't know when he was saved. He said, the first thing I'd like to ask God when I get to heaven is, when did you save me? I'd like to know. And he said, I think the answer I'm going to get is, I saved you in eternity past. And that's going to be all he's going to tell me. But we can remember our baptism. It's why baptism matters. And sometimes it's good to go back in our minds. I go back to Hartford Baptist Church. And there I was, baptized. And I can remember that day and my few friends who came from school and watched and witnessed that event. And my dad watched and witnessed it. And he came to the front. And he was the next person baptized, already a Christian, but had never been through the waters of baptism as a believer. In that service, he came out of conviction of the Holy Spirit that he needed to be baptized. Even just telling these stories, it makes me want to give thanks to Jesus. And you could do the same. Let's tell our good stories to one another. Number three, give thanks for godly role models. So it says here, you know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. So here, Paul's saying, we were role models to you. One way they were role models was this. In their culture, people that could speak and had good skills in kind of holding a crowd's attention could get money for their work. So one of the ways you judged how good someone was was how much money did they make. The equivalent in our culture would be stand-up comedy. You know, what size venue can you get booked at? If you can only manage the local pub and you're not paid, well, you're either on the way up or you're no good. But if you can fill Wembley Arena or the O2, then you're making millions. And so people tended to judge people doing what I'm doing now in monetary terms. And one of the reasons Paul worked with his hands stitching and making tents was so nobody would judge the message in terms of how big a crowd could he pull in and how many people profess faith and how much money would they give him. He said, I don't want that from you. I want you to judge the message on its own merits. And they learned a lot from Paul in that. Most of them were poor people. They'd have loved to have been the guy at the front raking in the money. And Paul said, that's not the Christian life. The Christian life is to work with your hands and share the gospel with your life and do it for nothing because there's a God who loves you. So Paul did that for them again. We've all got role models in the faith, haven't we? People we look up to, people who inspire, people who maybe are older in the faith, people in our workplaces who just seem to be really good at explaining their faith, getting getting alongside people, maybe Christians who are particularly kind. And it's just small acts of kindness make me want to be a kinder, better person. You ever see people doing that? I look around this room, I'm going to pick on Sharon. I look at the way that Sharon shares her faith so freely with other people. And she's a role model to me in getting alongside people who are hurt and broken and people who wouldn't have anything to do with this church. And I think that should be me. I need to learn from people like that. Do you see? And I could go around this room, but I won't make everyone go red and uh, I'll pick on Paul again. And so I'll just, but we could. I'm sure you've got people now who you're thankful for their example and their witness, some of them even now in glory, that you think about the way they lived and it makes you want to go on to the end, being a better follower of Jesus. Number four on the list. We're halfway, doing all right. 
Give thanks that God is greater than your sufferings. I'm not going to say too much on this one. It's just there we read it a moment ago. You became imitators of us, verse 6 says, and of the Lord, the Lord who suffered. For you welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Anyone who lives in this world is going to suffer at times. Anyone can grumble. But it takes a special work of God in the midst of suffering to actually live for him with joy, to see that our suffering is not in spite of God's plan, but part of it, and therefore has purpose. And so we want to give thanks in the midst of suffering, even if the suffering itself is evil and bad, that there is a good heart behind it from God who loves us, and he won't let us suffer for a moment longer than is for our good and his glory. That's really hard to believe, in the midst of suffering, but it is how it is. I think I saw that with Mary Windell recently. Mary died, obviously, a couple of weeks back. She loved life. She suffered greatly, and then she was given a terminal diagnosis, and there wasn't a dent in her joy. She loved this world. She loved Coffee Stop here. She loved this church. She loved her family. She loved Vernon. The list went on and on of things Mary loved. She, she just was one of those people that loved life. But I'll tell you what she loved more. She loved Jesus. So when she was told she had three to six months to live, she just carried on living as she had done exactly before and prepared for her not being here, but with a smile on her face. Joy in the midst of suffering. We can give thanks even then. Give thanks that God is using your life for his glory. So their lives were amazing and that they were transformed. It says, you not only were um, imitators of us, but you became role models to all the believers across the region. It'd be like this church being a witness to the whole of the Southwest. You know, the people say, oh, wow, you want to see Headley Park Church? There's something happening there. Well, these ordinary Thessalonians had had four weeks training. People were saying, you want to see what God has done there because your faith in God has become known everywhere. We don't need to say anything about it for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. And they tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. They repented. They came to faith in Christ. They turned away from idols to Jesus and everybody was talking about it. They were the talk of the region. Why would people do something that crazy? Why would people live that way? It just seemed unbelievable that people would give up so much and follow Jesus. And yet they were with joy, even in the face of suffering. There must be something to it. It must be real. I wonder at work. Many of you are working people, not everybody, but many of you. You know, there are opportunities there, aren't there? I was talking to one of our um, ladies this week who works as a cleaner. And uh, it's the most inspiring conversation. I, I think I have a lot of inspiring conversations. People say very nice things to me, and I get to hear a lot of things. It's just about her work. She goes into people's homes, she cleans, she goes home, she cleans her own home, cooks tea, and repeats. I think it's quite hard work if I'm honest, physically very demanding. But as she was talking to me, she said, I love my job. She said, I get to sing hymns all day long while I work. She said, I just sing. She said, there's always a tune that comes into my head and it's always one of the songs we sing at church. And I just sing around people's houses. And then she told me that one of her clients had had a baby and she thought, I'll just get them a children's Bible and I'll give it to them. And then she said to me, you'll never guess what, Neil? They've started reading a page of it to their little baby every day. That's life on the front line. That's what it takes for people across a region to be saying there's something going on there. Something good is happening in that place. It's living for Jesus with joy. Lastly, can't actually see the Bible anymore, but... It's there, I know it is. It says here, they tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to do one to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. You know, life here can be brutally hard. There are times when it's a struggle to get out of bed, it's a struggle to keep going. There are times where actually you may eventually not be able to get out of bed. And there's not much more for you to do here than wait. 
But the great thing for us as believers is that we wait in hope and not in fear. We don't have to fear the wrath of God. When you feel down, when you feel like life's against you, just remember this thing. What I deserve is God's wrath and condemnation. What I've got today is God's love and a peace with him. I'm a recipient of his grace and it's never going to be taken from me. What did it cost me? Well, there is a cost to being a Christian, isn't there? There's a cost. But it's right size when we remember what it cost him. You see, Jesus was raised from the dead because he died for you and he died for me. He died under the wrath that you and I deserve so that we can know it is fully paid for when he shouted, it is finished. And so we have six reasons at least here to be thankful. And if you want to keep your heart right with Jesus, then thankfulness is probably the best medicine of all. I think the greatest Bristolian of all time was actually a German, George Muller. I think he is the greatest person to ever live in this city. You can come and argue with me afterwards and prove me wrong. He cared for many, many orphans, and he didn't ever ask for money. He lived entirely by faith, and the Lord did miracle after miracle for him. Before I leave, I want to do a lecture on Muller. I'm just putting that out there. Here's the thing. Do you know what he said the most important thing in his life was? Brian Sparks actually showed this to me. He wrote a very short little essay just saying the most important thing every morning was to get his heart happy with Jesus. You know, I don't think I get that right. I have a quiet time. I go through the motions. Sometimes I pray. How would your time with Jesus tomorrow morning be different if you said, Lord, I just want my heart to be happy with you? And then just gave thanks. Just gave thanks thanks. Let me leave that with you there. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for these incredible words, the Apostle Paul, his heart for the Thessalonian church. And Father, we pray that you would help us to protect that first love in our hearts for you, Lord. The truth is, our love for you ebbs and flows. Sometimes we're passionate about you. Sometimes you feel a million miles away. Lord, often we feel like there's nothing we can do, but it isn't true. Lord, teach us to give thanks with a grateful heart. Teach us to look for the good things you are doing among us and give thanks for them. Help us to tell the good stories. Help us to remember your goodness, your goodness to us, your goodness to others, and spur one another on in love and good deeds. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.